Roman, can you hear me? Yeah, Adam. How you doing? Hello, Roman. Hello, everyone in the future. Welcome to Live Stream of Consciousness, episode of six. Uh, episode of six. Episode of six. We're off to a good start. Roman, what's on your mind? Um, just the fact that the robotic voice told me this meeting is being recorded. Yeah, that's, but don't you know, like funny. everything's being recorded. Everything goes on your permanent record nowadays. I see. So wait, so this isn't this isn't live. This is being recorded no, it's not for actually live. I mean, uh, the file might get live streamed. You see, live stream of consciousness is a concept, not a reality. Uh, <laughs> wow. Because <laughs> we have to set a good example by doing something the easiest way possible first, which is actually to record the meeting and upload it later. This is the way that everybody could do it very easily. Gotcha. Cool. Uh, how are you doing? You're looking scraggly. Oh, well, you know, it's the holidays. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I put on a shirt just for this. This is this is my drummer's shirt. Cool. So I'm following his excellent, excellent example. What is happening in America? This is your official job to explain America to me now. Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh that's a tall order. Um uh I don't know, man. We're yeah. we're uh being captured by uh a con artist. <laughs> we're yeah, we're in a cult. Is he going to leave? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I think he's going to have to leave at this point. I think there's just not really a mechanism by which he will get to stay. Uh, but he's certainly trying to find a way to stay. So who knows? You know. Well, I, I've, I've heard talk that he might try to start a third party, at least just to make money. Yeah, I mean, there's there's um, there was some news report of crowds at one of his rallies recently chanting destroy the GOP, which, you know, that's that kind of moves in that direction. Um, whether that actually ends up happening or whether the GOP will just contort itself to keep all of his supporters as they have been doing for four years, you know, that's unclear. Uh, well, but it is, it is kind of Bannon stunning. Said they were gonna do. I'm sorry? It's kind of what Bannon said they were going to do in the first place is like, you know, we're going to destroy the deep state, drain the swamp, like destroying the GOP would be the logical extension of that. Yeah, I mean, it's never really been clear, like, what the swamp is or what the deep state is aside sure. from like whoever happens to disagree with trump at any given time but yeah, i heard an interesting comparison on some podcast yesterday or maybe this morning saying uh well you know there is this naive assumption that like you know when obama appoints somebody it's because he thinks they'll be good for the job not because he wants to destroy a, a given institution because he thinks it's like you know cutting the fat or something that's the most charitable interpretation of like oh, he just really believes that a small government is good for everybody, therefore he's going to just destroy everything and fuck it all up. Um, you know, like that's the most charitable interpretation possible. Oh, I certainly don't think Trump believes that a small government is the best. I, I mean, I don't, I, I think that's that's attributing way too much agency and, and uh, you know, political philosophy to him. I don't think he really has a political philosophy of any kind. I think, I think his political philosophy is basically like, I like people who are nice to me and I don't like people who are mean to me. And that's pretty much the extent of it. <laughs> I, I guess yeah. so. I mean, what, what I tended to hear back in the day is that Trump didn't have a political philosophy, but that Bannon did. And that- But, but what Bannon did? Bannon was booted out, huh? Oh, Bannon, yes. Yeah. Uh. Um, I, I mean, because you, you, you have the analysis that Trump is basically playing distraction while Republicans are doing their own agenda. Yeah, I mean, yeah, lo lots of people around him have a political philosophy that they're trying to push through by using him, but um, it's just, you know, th that's the kind of like, th the political philosophy that they're pushing is a malignancy that's been around for a long time, but the special malignancy that Trump embodies is like a whole other level of malignancy, right? Like, it just, it it's just a cult of personality in a way that I don't think has existed in any other presidency in in at least in my memory um it it, it really like Is like there are things that if any other president had done you you would imagine the supporters of that president being like oh that's a shitty thing to do like there might be different things for different presidents right but there are things that like if obama did his supporters would be like oh that's bad i don't like obama anymore or like if bush did his supporters would be like oh that's bad i don't like bush anymore and with trump it's like actually not clear what those things are right like yeah, like when he said he could shoot somebody on Fifth Avenue, and, and people would still vote for him. Like he's clearly right, um, and it's not obvious. Like 
it's not obvious what limit there is to, to his support, if any. Um, and that's that's kind of weird, right? Like that's unprecedented as far as I can tell and, and really dangerous. Um, well, I think what happened is basically the jester became the king. And so he's like <laughs> immune to comedy. Like he's kind of is a comedian. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely like a, a kind of entertainment aspect to his presidency. Um, where he's just doing the thing that'll get the most engagement. Um, that's just like, that's just like Facebook. Yeah, there's that's, definitely that's a component of that. But the thing is, is that that doesn't really explain the support that he has, right? Yeah. Like it's, you know, a lot of people engage with Facebook and are still critical of Facebook, but a lot of people just just will go to the ends of the earth for Trump in a way that I just genuinely don't understand. Like I, oh. I, I really, I really can't figure that out. Okay, well, I mean, I'm, I'm obviously not the target demographic, so. Right, yeah, you're not the target, target demographic, for sure. And it's, it, it isn't, isn't a lot of it just, um, like, vendor lock-in, like, sunk cost? Like, like once, once you've devoted, like, X number of years of your life and this much of your social capital to, like, a weird personality cult, if it's wrong, that's, like, a lot harder to admit. Just, like, if you devoted, like, four years of your life to climate denial or something like that. Because like it's you know justification of effort, right? It's just like otherwise you're an idiot, so you better be right, so you double down, which is kind of the example that he sets in the first place. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure that's part of what's going on, but that that kind of explains the inertia aspect of it, but that mm. doesn't really explain the cult of personality in the first place, right? Like, mm. like why is it that he has this level of devotion that people are willing to do anything to refuse uh, confronting the the cognitive dissonance of supporting him? But, you know, other presidents who were who were quite popular. I mean, Obama, was, you know, had a strong base of support. How come he didn't have this same thing? You know, um, if Obama had shot a guy, a lot of Obama supporters would have stopped supporting him. Well, if you believe Bill Maher's theory, uh, Donald Trump uh, blackmails people to make them loyal. Well, what do you mean? Do you mean his his voters or do you mean mm, just like Republicans. the... Yeah. Oh, that I totally believe. But again, but oh, that really? doesn't explain what's going on with his voters. So you, you, yeah. I mean, I was, I was kind of like agnostic about it. I heard Bill Maher say it, but you think for sure Donald Trump blackmails other Republicans? Well, it depends what you mean by blackmail. I mean, I don't think yeah. he like has videos of them having sex that he's threatening to release. Well, that's, like, that's I don't he think he owned a lot of, he had a lot of hotels going on. He might. Oh no. I mean, I think, I think it's a, it's a much more like run of the mill kind of extortion that's mm. pretty visible, which is just, right. I will Twitter bomb you if you stand up against me and you know the, the problem is is that electoral margins are so narrow to begin with yeah that for any republican office holder to lose five percent of their support you know for the majority of them that means that they're not going to win their next election and so, so all trump has to do is to threaten to revoke the support of his supporters hmm. and and that's that's enough right that's that's enough of a threat so that's what i meant by blackmail hmm. it's it's funny because uh you know an analogy occurs to me how I don't know if you've heard Chomsky making this argument that um, regardless of where the virus came from, the pandemic didn't come from China. The pandemic came from economic conditions of like not having surge capacity in hospitals and, and so on. And it's funny because when you say that, like, you know, they can't, the, the margins are so narrow um, for the parties, you know, it's, it's an analogous to like the margins were narrow for the hospitals, even though in a way it's like, a, it's a different system. I mean, in the case of the two party system, you've got, um, uh, I don't know if you've heard of it by name, um, Diverger's Law, but like the idea that like first past the post tends towards a two-party system over mm -hmm. over time. Like if you just run iterated simulations, it's like, gee, I wonder why we have a duopoly. It's like, because it actually doesn't depend on anything you do in, in the long run. Like basically there are things that people do to speed it up if it's in their benefit for the duopoly to be powerful relative to alternatives. But luckily like, uh, you know, long-term time is on their side because the two parties is the, the, the first as opposed tends to towards towards this system and you know it would be it's not like it would be the exact same proof for why hospitals don't have surge capacity but you know it's, it's the same kind of this this kind of set uh, an, an entrenched system that produces narrow margins that thus um don't let people act sort of freely on like act their conscience or, or what have you yeah no i mean i think I think these are emergent properties of calibrating a system to a relatively kind of static equilibrium, right? And it works, you know, it, it reduces inefficiencies as long as nothing changes. 
right? But as soon as there's a shock to the system, like it's, it's really great to not have empty hospital beds just sitting there taking up space as long as you don't have something like a pandemic that all of a sudden you need a ton of empty hospital beds, right? Um, and, and, you know, the same thing with, with uh, elections, right? There's no reason to win by 30% or 40% if you can get all the same power by winning by 1%. Right? So there's just, there's, it, it's perfectly efficient, it's more efficient to win by 1% unless there's a shock to the system, right? Um, and so, you know, they, they've, every candidate and every party has finally calibrated their margins to win by just the narrowest amount possible. Um, and, and that means that they tremble in fear of anything changing, because as soon as something changes, those margins aren't going to be enough to actually sustain them anymore. But, well, but very of course, the situation. I'm sorry, because they're very fitted to the situation. Yeah, yeah, they've, they've, they've kind of like, very precisely calibrated it uh, to, to, to what the situation at least used to be at the last election, and there's kind of no no easy margin for error. But of course, both parties are doing that at the same time. So it's kind of not clear at any given time who any shock benefits. It's a really hard problem, right? Like this political strategizing thing is a really hard problem. Um, Breaking the duopoly is a very hard problem. Is well, the thing that was, the voting system produces it. But... Yeah, so, so hey, I mean, if you want unpopular opinions, here's an unpopular opinion. Oh, this I think is, This is what we're here for. <laughs> yeah, I figured. I figured you'd like this. Um, I think the two-party system is amazing. I think it's it's actually the best what? political system. <laughs> I wasn't ready for your opinion. This unpopular. <laughs> yeah, I know. I get. I get. Roman A two brute. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, no, but but here's the thing: is um, anybody who thinks that the two-party system is bad and we need more parties should go and live in any sort of uh, parliamentary democracy for a while. And what you end up having is just some faction, uh, or let me put it this way, some side of the political spectrum splits into more fa factions than the other. And you end up with this unsustainable, untenable situation where those factions have to compromise and negotiate and ally with each other. And sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. But the other, you know, it, it's like whichever side of the, of the spectrum splits into the least factions wins. And that's not that's not a good system of governance, right? So, like, t take Canada as an example. Canada has one right wing party, and it has two Alliance. major and one kind of smaller left wing party, right? So, it has the Liberal Party, it has the NDP, and it has the Greens. The Greens are are you know fairly small, not a huge electoral factor, but but still you know not nothing. Um, and and so what happens is that in order to govern. Either it just so happens that, you know, one of those factions like the Liberal Party has to win an outright majority, and that sometimes happens, but it's pretty infrequent. Or more often, the Liberals and the NDP have to form some sort of governing coalition. And if they don't, or if they, you know, split the vote, or if there is resentment by one faction against the other faction, whatever the case happens to be, the Conservatives end up in power, right? And so Canada has had more conservative government than it should have over the last like hundred years, um, just just because of this, right? And that's honestly that's the best case scenario, right? So compare that to Israel, which has like I don't know how many at this point, like maybe thirty or something political parties, uh, and there's just complete the paralysis. Front Judea, right? the Judean people's front. Well, what you what you actually have is like ten different re ultra religious parties mm -hmm. for for kind of different religious sects. And every party that wants to be in power has to kind of like make a deal with the devil with some subset of really, really tiny minority parties. And so the conservative parties, the conservative party in Israel, Bibi Netanyahu's party, has made alliances with a, a bunch of these religious ultra right wing parties, and they keep pulling the major conservative party over further and further to the right. Uh, because that's the only way that party can sustain its its governing coalition, right? In a two-party system, all of those people would have just been voted down in the primaries, and they they wouldn't have mattered for the balance of power, right? Like those kind of fringe opinions wouldn't have required a compromise. But in a system where you've got tiny, tiny margins between two major parties, and the difference in those margins is like some third fringe, crazy extremist party, all of a sudden, everybody has to negotiate and compromise with like, a party that represents 2% of the population. Um, and that's that's not at all healthy for democracy. So, so it's, it sounds like you're saying, um, it sounds like you're saying um, 
we have to have polarization because otherwise we have polarization. Um, well, you know I no, I guess what I'm saying is that a two party system actually produces less polarization because what it does is that it, it forces consensus building within each side of the political spectrum. So you end up with, you know, a, a right that is not as right wing as it might be because it's averaged out its center right elements with its crazy right elements and a left that's done the same. And, you know, the problem the problem in America is that the center right elements have all shifted to the right, like everything, the entire right wing spectrum has shifted to the right. There just is no real center right left anymore. There's just like, you know, pretty extreme right and really, really, really extreme right. Um, but again, that's just, you know, I, I can't imagine how that would be any better with a parliamentary system or a five party system or a 10 party system or whatever you want. Well, um, I mean, I, I assume Israel like Canada also uses first past the post. Um, because like the Canadian situation, like yes, there are multiple parties, but there are two major parties, and that is at least in the long run would be due to first past the post. Because even if even if Canada wasn't like that right now, run it for a hundred years, and it would have it, it it would it would it would tend towards the liberal conservative situation all over again. Like even suppose you broke up the two big parties in Canada, he said, this is a duopoly. We're going to have like market regulation and break up the political duopoly. And then, but, but don't change first past the post and run Canada for another hundred years. You'd end up back in the same situation uh, all over again. Um, yeah. So, but, but not, be, but not, um, but it, it's due to first past the post, not, not due to any kind of like legal, um, any like, like, like that, that alone would create that kind of polarization. Um, because that's how that voting system does in the, in the long run. So I could be wrong, but I don't, I, I probably am wrong and I shouldn't talk about things yeah. I don't know, but um, I am reasonably confident that Israel doesn't have a first past the post system. I think Israel actually has a proportional, I'm trying to look this up now. Well, I think Israel actually okay. has a so proportional. Yeah, I more about ranked ballots, but then again, there's all, once, once you start, once you start fiddling with the rules, there's a lot of possibilities. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, well, my internet's not working well enough to Oh, well, I'll do a little research. <laughs> but I believe they don't have um, rank ballots. And um, no, I mean, the, the broader idea is that there's probably um, th there's probably some variation in, in what the rules produce over time if you if you fiddle with them, right. And, uh, you know, it might not be so much like you're you're right about the current situation in Canada, you know, um, that that it's effectively a two party system, even though it's not on paper, you know, and uh, I mean, I, I mean, I guess I always thought that that's the silver lining potentially with Trump as if we end up with with more than two parties, but I guess uh, you, you're, you're, you're saying that, well, I mean, it's supposing what you're saying is right, something else would have to change to avoid it effectively being the same thing all over again. Um, but actually, there's this sort of being held hostage by the extremes factor added into it. But it seems like yeah, that's exactly. Happening in America, like aren't well, aren't the parties already held hostage by their extreme bases? Like 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 Biden has to has to seem like more of an extreme leftist than he is. And and I mean, I don't know how, what Trump really thinks. <laughs> that's kind of his design. But uh, he certainly has to appear pretty far right to appeal to the kind of base that he has. Yeah, I mean that that's that's right. There's definitely a a, a component of that. Um, I mean, you know, maybe it maybe it has less to do with the particular electoral system and more to do with the narrow margins that we were talking about, right? Like as long as whatever party or governing coalition of parties is going to get power by fifty percent plus one voter, um, right? It's it any extremist faction within that coalition or within that party is going to have inordinate power. Right. All you have to do is threaten to withhold your support and all of a sudden everybody else has to do what you want them to do in order to be able to govern it all. Um, so so maybe that's right. I guess I guess all I'm saying is I just don't see why the two party system is inherently bad and more parties is inherently good. And I don't see why having more parties would solve a lot of the problems that um, people are definitely right to be concerned about with with the current American system. It just seems like a lot of these problems are, you know, kind of independent at least of, of the existence so, of just two parties. Okay, so flip, flip the question and say like, what would be a better change 
to happen in the American system uh, uh, better than introducing a party. Because it could be maybe because maybe my like ultimate fantasy is right that like yeah five parties would be good but only if you make these ten other changes you know yeah yeah so like like what what would you change if not the number of parties um I don't know I mean honestly I don't know um, for, first of all I'm just way out of my depth um, yeah. I mean there are people who who know much more about this um, yeah but presumably this is, but you know this is the sort of question that presumably everybody should weigh in on well maybe I mean. I don't know. I'm happy to defer to expertise in lots of things. And like designing a good political system is, is one thing that I'm actually very happy to defer to, to expertise on. Um, and you it's something where I haven't done enough of my own your Vote for president or anything like that. Like, like, like there, there's and some things I do. And some things I do. I mean, if I don't know, for example, whether, you know, what the net costs and benefits are of fracking, I'm going to, um, you know, defer to expertise on analyses of whether fracking is net good or net bad in order to make a decision of whether I support a candidate who likes fracking or not. Okay, well then, then let's, let's extend that idea. And suppose I, I think that, um, suppose I think I'm too stupid to vote for prime minister in the Canadian election and, and you should vote for me. And, yeah. and, and um, we have a system where I can delegate my vote to you because hey, it's just not my expertise. I'll let someone else worry about politics. Yeah. You know, like, the, there's lots of, you know, there's could be pluses or minuses of such a system. Um, and it's a good exercise to like imagine different systems, but it seems like the big minus is that people could just give up on politics completely. I could give you my vote for the rest of my life and be like, you know what, Roman, from now on, you have two votes. I don't think about politics. I, I don't want, I don't, well, I don't want to worry about it. Well, but we already have that system. I mean, the system nothing is stopping you. That's not a system. That's just an individual decision anyone's free to make. Like you could go and do that right now, and I'm sure something. Oh no, no, but I, but legally, I couldn't take a picture of my ballot to prove to you that I voted the way you wanted me to. Like even if like you're sure. paying me to vote. But that's a, that's a different question. Like that's a question of you know could you sell your vote or could you then you know have the person who's telling you how to vote verify that you voted the way that they told you to? And like yeah, that that system is not in place for the obvious reasons of preventing vote selling, um, but. But that's different, right? That's nothing is preventing you from just just voluntarily deferring to somebody's expertise and saying, hey, tell me how to vote. I, I understand. But so like, but isn't it, um, but you're not allowed to do it on paper because it's supposed to be a bad idea for some reason, right? Yeah, like, like, like well, I think the reason I is that as soon as you, I, I'm not allowed to legally promise to do it. Uh, well, no, again, you're allowed to promise. You're just not allowed to ask for proof. And the, and the oh, reason okay. for that is- In like an effective way, like in an enforceable way, I'm not allowed to- Right, right, but, they, but there's a key difference there. And it's, it's not because we don't want people voluntarily mm -hmm. uh, deciding that they're gonna defer to expertise in how they vote. It's because we don't want to even make possible uh, paid voting schemes, right? Like yeah, guess... we want to just forestall any possibility of anybody being able to pay anybody else for their vote. I mean, I guess it could be naive of me to think that the government actually wants to encourage independent thought. Like, that's what you guys want, right? You want us all to think independently, right? Oh, <laughs> whoops. So um, do you do you feel Trump has like, um, not that I want to talk about Trump the whole time, but like. Uh, oh, well, I was going to say, this is like already so much of my well, mental well, life as it is. Well, what I want to talk about is, is polarization, I guess. I mean, we can talk about something else as well, but, um, you know, because the psychology of polarization, people say that he's destroyed the conversation. Like, do, do you feel discourse itself breaking down? Because, you know, that's what we're doing here. We're having discourse. You know, we, we can build it back up again if, if it's true, um, that is that the, the conversation is breaking or is broken, that that presumably has an impact on like every future conversation that you should have if, if you're hearing the, the collective conversation is broken and that's why we're in this political mess, you know, or like Trump has poisoned the discourse. Yeah, I mean, I don't have anything um, terribly original, I guess, to say. I think I think what I'm going to say is just stuff that you um, probably already think, which is it just doesn't seem like there is a single national conversation, right? It seems like there's a kind of right-wing conversation and a left-wing conversation, and they have a share a, a, a non-shared set of facts or two two non-shared sets of facts, um, and there's no possible way you can really have a discourse when we can't even agree about you know. Kind of basic verifiable things um like we can't agree about the size of trump's crowd at his inauguration even though we have pictures of it right like it's like if we can't agree about stuff like that i don't really know how we go about trying to persuade each other 
And so the, the end result is that, you know, people stop trying to persuade each other and they start talking in, you know, among groups that already generally agree with them and they might be trying to persuade each other on the margins within those groups, but, uh, but, but they're working off of a shared set of facts, right? It's like, you know, I, I don't know how you would persuade somebody who, you know, just has a fundamentally different theory of, uh, I don't know, just very, very, very basic facts about the world than you do, right? Like, how would you persuade somebody of, uh, about the merits or the demerits of like evolutionary psychology if they have a, you know, like naive vitalist uh, seventh century conception of, of biology in the first place, right? Like, it's just, you need some shared set of facts in order to even be mm. able to engage in discourse and persuasion. Um, and it seems like we're losing that. Mm. But you know, other people do that same thing of like deferring to expertise. They just tend to, you know, like in the case of like anti-vaxxing, they're like choosing very dubious experts to defer to. Yeah, that's right. And so there's like that's a right. network structure problem of like, because because I, I noted how you formulated the question of how do you convince someone of such and such? And I thought, well, maybe the question is more who convinces who? Because if you have like a, like a spectrum of opinion, I mean, I, I tried to form this concept maybe a year ago as ideal deliberative distance. If you have two people from the extremes and you like put them in a Zoom call together, like they're maybe not going to get very far because they're so polar yeah. opposites. But two people who already agree on everything, they'll be like, well, good work, buddy. Like, here's a pat in the back, you know, and, and nothing necessarily happens. And, so, and you yeah. might think that if two people talk to each other and they are like, hmm, we didn't, did, we didn't disagree about enough then they could each say, okay, well, we should each recommend somebody that we think the other person will disagree with about something, but like in a way that like more than us, basically. If people are like, we didn't, we have nothing for us to resolve. We're in an echo chamber. We agree on everything, you know? Um, then they, then you could move in terms of social network distance, like one step further apart or one step, two steps, whatever, and be like, okay, do these people disagree enough, but not too much to have, it's sort of like a Goldilocks search yeah. for like the, the right heat of an argument. Yeah, yeah, that's right. But, uh, but, right, I mean, I guess, I guess I just, another way of saying what I was trying to say is that it seems like there's no functional way of doing that between the political right and the political left in what? America. We might be doing it right now with a, a decentralized approach to podcasting like this, you never know. <laughs> well, I think you and I... Necessarily in this, it doesn't have to be involved. Yeah, you and I are probably, you know, already in pretty close alignment. Like, maybe we're not totally in, like, pat on the back, good job, buddy. Uh, world, but we're not that far from that world. Right? Yeah, so we'd have to we'd have to build out out from there, you know. Um, it, our you know, people in general would have to build out from conversations at roughly this distance to conversations at like gradually. Because because suppose mm -hmm. suppose if people did that in general, like everybody talks to somebody that they start with somebody that like they're kind of politically aligned with, and they can talk about stuff and be like, yeah, that's the state of the world, blah blah. blah. And then and, and if lots of people did that, and then they all went one step further out gradually like that, and also yeah. like it's all recorded then we can we can sort of diagnose after the fact and be like well here's the first disagreement that went off the rails as people started arguing with their say with their friends and relatives who are you know this much further out from them politically because like there's got to be like the perfect thanksgiving argument you know what i mean <laughs> like that it <laughs> it's within family or within you know peer group or whatever so people are taking each other seriously and they do want to resolve it but it's yeah. different enough that it's like they have different media diets or what have you and you know, I, I feel like um, I feel like people naturally I feel there's a natural healthy hunger for something like that that people have, but it's being fed by sort of junk food of like, here, here's where your instinct for disagreement should be fed. Yeah, yeah, no, I think that's totally right. I mean, I, there's a reason why people watch political punditry as much as they do, right? right. It's, there's something about that that they want to consume. They want to consume people's opinions um, and the opinions that they're consuming are sort of increasingly fringe, increasingly polarized, increasingly uh, de detached from, from any sort of good faith, honest argumentation or commitment to facts or commitment to even handedness. Um, and, you know, I'm sure there's complex interactions there of kind of tribalism and wanting to see somebody yell at the other tribe um, with just, you know, the, a kind of a shared basis of, of, of facts and, and um, what you can possibly engage with. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know. I mean, I, I really don't know how you solve it. Like I said, I don't think I was going to say anything original about this. I, I, I don't know how you solve this or how you um, get people to talk who wouldn't normally talk. Um, 
I guess, I mean, I, I think you're absolutely right to point out that a lot of it comes down to trust and, and sources of trust, right? Like, I get really pissed off when liberals um, kind of bash conservatives for, uh, you know, not understanding the scientific evidence on climate change. Because guess what? Like, unless you're a climate scientist, you don't. if you're a liberal, you also don't understand the scientific evidence on climate change. I actually did this as an you exercise once. Someone a little more trustworthy. Yeah, exactly. Right, exactly. So, so like I went and I tried to read the primary literature on climate change and I understood, you know, like a couple of words per page or something that were being used. I understood all the function words and, and pretty much none of the content words. Um, and, and so, and you know, like I'm, I'm a pretty expert consumer of, of scientific papers. And so like, there's just, there's no, th there's no way in which my opinions or anyone else's opinions outside of, of the actual academic enterprise of studying climate change there's no way that those opinions are formed by actual engagement with the actual science. They're all just formed by trust. And so the question is, you know, do you trust what climate change scientists or, you know, people who are kind of reporting climate science or people who are reporting on reports of climate science, do you trust those folks, um, right, whose beliefs are ultimately grounded in the scientific expertise, maybe one or two or three steps removed? Or do you trust people who, you know, whose beliefs are ultimately grounded in I don't know what anti-intellectual hatred of, of the liberals or uh, an assumption that the scientists are just in it for the grant money uh, or uh, I don't know, a religious belief that the earth is a certain number of years old or you know whatever, there, there are lots of different ways in which you can ground that out. But, but the point is it all comes down to sources of trust, right? There's absolutely no independent ability to evaluate the evidence on any one side. That's interesting, yeah, because um... You might think, oh yeah, science education is the bottleneck. People just need a little more science education, right? And then they'll finally understand climate science and vaccine science. And it's like, right? I mean, even supposing we're at that point now in a hundred years, uh, science will be that much more complicated. That like science education, unless there's a breakthrough in education itself, like AIs learn how to teach us really fast or something like that, then you're you're gonna have. Uh, you know, increasingly, you're gonna have a situation where it's increasingly less realistic to say like, oh, we just need more science education because there's gonna be some delegation and some some farming out. I mean- Yeah, um, that's right. Yeah, so, it, so it's pe people, <laughs> it's almost as if people needed to be taught more about who to trust and how to tr yeah. not trust the wrong people in their lives, let alone like in politics. Um, yeah. Because like, if, you know, cause like you know, which isn't to say there couldn't be a science of that. I mean, maybe psychology could apply itself to teaching people to gauge trust better. I don't know. I mean, well, here's the other thing is it's not like those people are that wrong to mistrust scientists right. and let's say whatever pharmaceutical companies. Um, right. I mean, there's the a long crisis. What? Just look at the opioid crisis. It's like, yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, there's, there's up. a lot of, there's a lot of um, history of, various people with a product profit motive being um, incentivized to be corrupt. And so for those people to then say, hey, like, trust us this time, right, is is kind of perverse. Like if you actually talk to, you know, anti-vaxxers, for example, about why they're anti-vaxxers, they'll say, well, I don't trust doctors. Why don't you trust doctors? Well, because doctors have a financial incentive to give me a vaccine. That's absolutely true, right? Of course, doctors have a financial incentive to give you a vaccine. And of course, pharmaceutical companies have a financial incentive to sell you this thing that yeah. they spent billions of dollars developing, billions. right? There's absolutely nothing wrong with that kind of reasoning. It's, it's totally fair to be mistrustful of people who have this kind of financial conflict of interest. Um, the, as long as you also distrust the, the people who tell you not to take the vaccine. Exactly, right. So that's what I was gonna say. So, so so the, the, where the, I think, mistake comes in is it's not in being skeptical, it's in being kind of only skeptical of that side and not skeptical of the alternative, right? Yeah. Like if you're gonna be skeptical, you have to be skeptical fairly to everyone. And, and here's the other thing is it's, it's also, I think this is actually even bigger than the not being skeptical of the alternative. It's not knowing um, what the actual incentive structures are and what the actual system of checks and balances is that would uh, help allay your skepticism and your mistrust, right? So the point is, you're completely right to be mistrustful of pharmaceutical companies, sort of on the face of it, but that's why we have mechanisms like the FDA. That's why we have mechanisms like independent academic peer review. And if you actually understand how those things work, and if you understand how 
how carefully they've been designed to prevent gaming of that system by people who have a financial incentive in it, then you start to be able to gain a little bit more trust in it. Basically, you know, what, what we've consciously done is we've set up a system of opposing financial incentives, right? Like the incentive, maybe there's some incentive for the vaccine company to push a drug on you, but guess what? There's an even bigger incentive for that vaccine company not to push something that's going to just murder billions of people, right? Because if they did that, they nobody would ever buy anything from them again, right? And that's a kind of countervailing interest that they have. And then there's a further kind of countervailing interest of being penalized by the government if they falsify data or if they, um, you know, whatever, are somehow underhanded in, in what they're doing. And again, none of these checks and balances work perfectly. Like you should be mistrustful of them, but they exist. And if you don't understand that they exist uh, or, you know, maybe a little bit about how they work, um, you're going to be mistrustful of the wrong things, right? Mm. So, so the point is, I think that's what scientific literacy, it, it's not even scientific literacy, it's more like social institutional literacy, right? right? Like it's understanding enough about how these institutions are set up and what the different incentives are to actually understand whether you should be uh, trusting or not of any particular case. Well, you know, what, I, what I've thought for a while that would help is if some sort of vaccine, um, you know, authority granting body published a list of vaccines rank ordered from safe, most safe to least safe and said like, look, this vaccine is the median vaccine in terms of safety. And these other vaccines are way above the median. As, you know. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, again, this is way outside of my area of expertise, but but my sense is that there's actually like extremely little variance in how safe they are. And they're all just overwhelmingly super safe. I mean, in the case of vaccines, not in the case of all experimental treatments. The reason vaccines are so safe is precisely because they're administered to so many people, right? Like any any screw up in the testing, the safety testing of a vaccine would have such enormous mega consequences that are much worse than a screw up in the safety testing of like a drug that is only used to treat some very specific rare disease that not many people have. So vaccines sort of by the nature of just how, how they're administered and how many people they're given to have to be made to be much, much safer uh, than, than kind of most pharmaceuticals. Um, I mean, you, you, so could, I don't, you, yeah. could, you could be right, but the, the point I'm, I'm trying to get isn't so much about the, the details about this or that vaccine or anything like that, but um, psychologically how you present this kind of debate in a way that isn't too skeptical or too polarizing. Right. Right. Because if, right. If, so what kind of evidence can you give people to build their trust? Um, yeah, because because if, if it's rank ordered, then you're still admitting there's a difference. You're not saying everything's safe. Just look. Don't ask any questions. Just listen to us. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I, I think, right. So I mean, transparency, I think what you're pointing to with this rank ordering idea is just transparency, right? Like if you can actually be transparent about what the relative risks are, mm -hmm. then people will have some reason to trust you. Um, but I guess what I'm trying to say is, in the case of vaccines in particular, transparency actually does mean saying there's basically very little risk. Like that's, that just seems to be the case. You know, the, you can publish the variance at the top of the list. You can say like, look, well, I mean, here's a picture of the distribution and right. there's a clustered, just, you know, that could be the claim. But like- Right, so that's, right. So that's the scientific- You know, straight up with component. people, at least if that's, yeah, I mean, that, and that's not, like, you don't have to know climate science or vaccine science to, to think right. in those terms, right? Like- That's right. Yeah. Right, you have to be able to, to you know, read a graph and, and do kind of like basic statistical inference. And um, yeah, so there are definitely some scientific literacy skills, but they're not actually that- But, but you see that literacy- I have that literacy, but I can't find the graph I want to look at, right? So it, it's, right. It, and I know it's a chicken and the egg problem with like publication and what people can consume and so on. But like, I, I feel like I feel like um, you know various various authorities want to maintain an authority which is more binary than that, you know, because they, they want to be able to yeah. say like, listen, these are the these are the shots you take. Shut up! They're, like, there, there's no question about it. Where you know. Because because you could if you were going to do this system you could even create some shitty vaccines just to put them at the bottom of the list you'd be like look these ones were rejected in early trials like we don't actually use these ones you know like you can include all right. the ones that were rejected right. there must be some otherwise why are you doing the trials right for sure be like these are the ones we would never give you right and they they go on the list too <laughs> <laughs> right like well they don't exist but yeah well, like, I mean they're not products they don't exist but like in yeah, yeah. early trials they would have to exist otherwise the trials yeah. aren't weeding anything out right. 
Yeah, no, that's right. That's right. Um, yeah, I don't know where you find such a list. I wouldn't be surprised if there was such a list somewhere if you were to look for it. But but I guess this gets to, to another related well, point, which is source. well, there's gonna be there's gonna be degrees of uh, kind of how much people want to quote unquote do their own research, right? Like there's gonna be a lot of people who are perfectly happy just being told by an expert, this is safe, right? Take it. Um, like I'm probably one of those people in the vast majority of situations. Um, yeah, I guess that's that's getting smaller due to sort of online radicalization. Well, right, and so, so you know, one consequence I think, or one take from from the, um, I guess, growing prevalence of online radicalization is that people want to quote unquote do their own research more than you know most uh, expert elites thought they did, right? Like most most of the government and the media and the establishments of various institutions just thought that if we tell people what to think, by and large, people will trust us and accept it, right? And it turns out that people are actually pretty motivated to be skeptical. It turns out that people want to go and check a lot of those claims. And I think you're right that without reliable sources to, um, you know, do that with, they end up going to kind of fringy, wacko, conspiracy theorist sort of things um, and, you know, if I, if I try to Google anything about like vaccine safety data, you know, how quickly do you think I'll end up on some anti-vaxxer conspiracy website, right? Like probably immediately. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's a huge problem, right? Like if there were alternative sources of information that were trustworthy, that were detailed, that provided you information that was critical, but fair that you could evaluate for yourself, um, right, that would that would be huge, but but here's the problem: what would make those sources trustworthy, right? So, mm. on the one hand, they have to be they they have to not have the same conflict of interest, the same kind of financial incentives that make you mistrust the experts in the first place, right? Like if the CDC, who is the one who is telling me to get a vaccine, uh, if they release some information about relative vaccine safety. Well, I'm not likely to trust the information that they're giving me if I'm the kind of person who doesn't trust them telling me the vaccine is safe in the first place, right? So I want some sort of independent source, some sort of independent agency, right? Um, but then how do you ensure the real independence of that kind of group? Oh, ensuring the independent. Well, there, there's getting people to trust and then making it actually trustworthy. Like, you know, like in politics, we have the official opposition. You imagine you could imagine like a, the CDC having an official opposition whose whose job actually it is is to pick holes in the CDC's argument, but from a more academic kind of standpoint, right. you know, because then people, you know, because, yeah, you know, you do want to feed that in, the healthy part of that instinct to be critical with. Yeah, like, that's right. Here's the way to focus it, because that, that's what people do get when they do gain that trust of science through science education, like like if you have good teachers, they'll be glad when you're critical of them in a healthy way. Right. Right. Uh, you know, yeah. in, especially in philosophy and in like the more philosophical parts of science education, because you do get the dogmatic science education. It's just like, here's a textbook, memorize it. And then people think that's how science works. And unfortunately, sometimes it is how it works. And that's, you know, there's, there's some yeah. corruption in science. Now, I think, you know, the, there's the corruption in science and corruption in politics. To me, they're part of the same corruption, because to me, it's about the structure of of a conversation network, essentially. What you know, do you like, mean? Well, I mean, if if um, well, there's epistemic reasons for for science, and epistemic reasons for democracy as well. Like uh, like you know, like um, there's Condorcet's jury theorem, for instance, that like if if people are just better than chance as jurors, then the, as the number of jurors increases, the chance of the jury getting the right verdict actually approaches one. And that's kind of mm -hmm. like scientific replication, mm -hmm. right? And so you have to have those, like, um, you have to have the opportunity for replication. Like, and you actually need that contrary lab that wants to prove the other lab wrong and so on. And just like in the legal system, you're supposed to have this opponent process of the two lawyers. And, and supposedly it's a healthy thing in politics. I mean, you, you, might, you might find a way to sing the praises of the two-party variant in that case. Um, but but something, something's gone wrong. Like that natural opposition has, has you know, it's a there's, you know, in, like in politics, it doesn't seem like a very healthy um, critique that the parties are giving each other at this point, right? right. And, and the corresponding cultural tribes as well. It's like, oh yeah, they're at each other's throats. But is it is it a way where we're 
that that competition is producing something that's like collaboratively useful because that that was you know you would hope that that was the original hope <laughs> that that you want this competition right. between the parties or between groups making rival scientific claims to 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 produce a healthy conversation uh, yeah you know. yeah well so I mean, I think from a from a trust perspective, whether it's in politicians or in science or in anything else, um, I think what the basic problem comes down to is what you're really trying to do is you're trying to um, understand what what the facts are as you know the person who knows the facts the best believes them to be, right? So you're really trying to get at kind of the ground truth to the extent that anybody knows anything like the ground truth, but there's a signaling problem, right? Which is that you're getting some message and that message is not a perfect, honest, you know, high fidelity reflection of the ground truth. And you have to reverse engineer that message to get at the truth. Now, ideally the message is honest and, and doesn't have any motivations to, you know, be corrupted. And so you ideal. can just, yeah, right. Well, so you can just try, you know, it's like if, if somebody has no reason to lie to you and they tell you, like, if you ask me what I ate for breakfast, presumably I have no reason to lie to you. And so if I just say, like, I had whatever eggs and bacon, you'll be like, okay, I guess it's true that Roman had eggs and bacon, right? Um, but if you know that I'm, you know, ashamed of my bad eating habits, um, and I tell you that I ate whatever, that I ate a salad, and you know that I have some reason to conceal from you that I actually ate eggs and bacon, now all of a sudden, you know, you're going to be skeptical when I say I ate a salad. And you should be, right? Because you know that I have some reason to not give you a signal that has a high fidelity. So, okay, so there's an inherent um, kind of justifiable skepticism of, of the fidelity of any message, right? Like whether it's actually transmitting uh, the, the truth to you or not. So how do you make sure that a message has high fidelity? Well, the best way to make sure, right, is if it's actually telling you something that, you know, that is the opposite, right? That couldn't possibly be, uh, it's money be caused by a desire to, con to conceal some truth, right? So for example, if somebody tells you a vaccine is safe and what they actually might be concealing is that the vaccine is not safe, right? And the incentives are shifted towards concealing that. Of course, like nobody actually has any incentive to conceal a safe vaccine, but people have lots of incentive potentially to conceal a dangerous vaccine, right? So a message that tells you a vaccine is dangerous is inherently more trustworthy mm. than a message that tells you a vaccine is safe, right? Until you consider the reasons that someone could profit off of that. Right, exactly, right, exactly, exactly. So, so there's... There's an inherent kind of asymmetry there um, that, that I think causes this kind of mistrust. And I don't know how you ever get rid of that. Like, even if you had what you were saying, like this kind of scientifically reasonable mm. opposition, right? There would be a third party that came along that would say, well, actually both of those other parties, both the you know, scientifically reasonable pro-vaccine and the scientifically reasonable con-vaccine sides are lying to you. The vaccine is actually much more dangerous than what either of them would have you believe. Well, right? you know, in, in computer proof verification, there's this thing called, like for mathematical proofs, not for empirical proofs, um, empirical evidence, there's this thing called the, the De Bruijn criterion, named after some guy, that basically says your proof can be as long as you want, but the program that checks the proof has to be really short. Mm -hmm. And this is kind of the social analog of that same problem because, you know, people have a limited amount of time and like, you know, mm -hmm. ability to double check to use to do some kind of right. double checking. And right. so you, you could imagine a situation in which, you know, maybe science was, you know, slightly, you know, I'm not saying this is really a good idea, but you could imagine a situation where science is in like a more standardized language. So you, a, a random person could spot check a random article. In fact, you could have sessions of like, I mean, you could imagine this being required more of like, the bills that get passed you imagine a law that said like every new bill that gets passed you have to show it to a random person and then test their understanding of it and if a randomly selected person from the population can't understand the bill then like you know maybe you need to rewrite it <laughs> or or you need to educate people more before you pass such a complicated law but that but that's that force pushes for simplicity but it doesn't get rid of the of the kind of um the asymmetry of trust, right? Like it doesn't get rid of the fact that there's more reason to trust a message 
that is telling you a ground truth that it wouldn't be profitable or that there wouldn't be some ulterior motive to fake. Right. Yeah, so yeah, like, yeah. if it's just the case that, um, well, you know what I'm saying? If it's just the case that, that, um, you know, there's no reason to ever fake a, a, a dangerous vaccine, but there's lots of reason to fake a safe vaccine. And I think that's just fundamentally, that is the case, right? Then a message that tells you that a vaccine is safe is always going to be more untrustworthy, less trustworthy than a message that tells you a vaccine is dangerous, because there's always an alternative explanation for the message that the vaccine is safe. And it doesn't matter how easy it is to check, you know, to check the data or to check the paper, because ultimately you still have to believe that the people who wrote the paper are reporting it accurately, that they're not motivated to lie to you, whatever it is, right? And so those those things are still going to be asymmetrical there, even if you make, you know, if you make like scientific publications super, super easy to read or something. It's a thought provoking place, maybe for us to leave it, Roman. I think we've, we've broken it down into two. We've broken an important question into two questions, which is as productive as we could hope to be in this span of time. I know you're a very busy man, sir. Thank you for joining us here on uh, the live stream of consciousness. Um, anything that you wanted to address before we sign off? Nothing at all. Uh, I miss you. I hope you're doing well. There we go. I've unburdened your mind completely. You're completely satisfied. Yes. Thanks for joining us, everybody.